Uh, good morning. Uh, I thank the organizers for um, inviting me. And uh, thanks for all the effort you put into this uh, event. Uh, I think you should keep the thanks to the speakers after you see the talks, but <laughs> thanks anyway. Uh, so, what I'd like to do is start the morning um, in a relatively calm pace. Uh, tell you a bit about the history of the area, um, you know, it's a bit of introduction to, to lattices. Um, and as you'll see uh, later today, uh, we'll catch up some more speed and uh, we'll hear more in-depth talks about this. Um, so, and um, I guess since this first talk is supposed to be introductory and I really don't, I, I want everyone to understand and feel free to interrupt me. Um, and uh, I just realized there are some people here from the from America, from the US or Canada. So if you feel you fall asleep, ask your neighbor to wake you up. I try to make sure um, that you're all awake, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm also coming from the, those time zones, so um, you know, I, I might have difficulty to. Uh, so what's the, uh, so what's the topic of this Windows School? The topic is um, 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 lattices and how to do crypto with them. So let me start this, this talk with, with talking about lattices. And uh, uh, I guess the first thing is uh, I should say is so what are, what are lattices? I mean, maybe some of you have not heard of, about it before. So here's an example. At least um, in Israel, it's the same thing. This is this is this is a lattice, uh, or it's a lattice, but it's in Israel, it's almost the same thing. It's it's actually uh, uh, well, they are arranged in a certain pattern, and the pattern of the lattices is a lattice. Um, so here it's kind of the same thing, but I guess uh, a broad uh, two different notions of a lattice and a lattice, and this is more like a lattice. So what is a lattice? A lattice is a set of points in um, high-dimensional space, typically. This is uh, three-dimensional space, um, and they're arranged in this periodic-like manner. So this is um, an example of a three-dimensional lattice, but it's not quite a lattice because it doesn't go all the way to infinity, but I guess you get the picture. So, I'm not going to go into too many definitions right now. We'll have that in the second hour, but just, just in case you know what I'm talking about. Um, more formally, a lattice is the following thing. A lattice is a set of points defined in the following way. So we take n linearly independent vectors in R to the n, and then we take all the integer combinations of, of those points. Okay, so for instance, here in that example, um, I took no, v1 and, and v2, and these are two, two vectors, and then I take all the integer combinations. So for instance, I have twice v2, uh, v1 plus v2, twice v1, and you know, there are also negatives like minus v2. I don't show it in the picture, but this kind of, kind of goes all over the place, goes uh, in all directions. Okay, um, there's of course zero, zero, always in a lattice, okay, the zero point. Um, and you kind of, you know, you, you, I guess you, you get a picture. So there's all these integer combinations of these two vectors, and it forms this kind of grid. Um, this is what, what we call a lattice, and, and the um, set of points, something we call, we call a basis. The set of points v1, v2, up to vn is a basis of L. Okay, so it's a, it's a lot like the linear span of the vectors, except we take integer combinations. And this is what, what gives it the discrete structure. So I'm not going to talk too much about that in this in the first hour. Let me just say one thing, which is kind of the key to why lattices are so important in crypto. Um, and this is the fact that, take, take for instance these two vectors. Let me try to demonstrate this. So take these two vectors, v1 and v2, and try to think what kind of lattice they would generate. Okay, so if, you know, if, if you think for a second, you would say, say, v1 plus v2 is going to be a very long vector somewhere far away. Maybe the lattice has some kind of strange shape, but actually if you you know, try to uh, look at it more carefully, you see this is actually the lattice they generate. And maybe the first, thing you, first time you see it, it might be a bit surprising, how come the vectors here are so close to the origin, but then the fact is that you have cancellations, right? You could have three times v2 and then minus four times v1, and you get back to a point here close to the origin, okay? So, and this is kind of the key why lattices are, are so useful, because even though the bases might be long, basis vectors are long, there are short vectors in the lattice, and in particular, the basis is not unique. That's another, another feature. Um, these two vectors, v1 prime, v2 prime, are also a basis of the same lattice. Okay? 
And this is kind of the key in crypto because we're trying to, uh, as you'll see later today, we're trying to hide the, 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 the structure of this lattice, the geometrical structure of the lattice. So instead of giving you V1 prime, V2 prime, I'll give you V1, V2. Okay? Okay, so a bit of history. Here are some of the mathematicians who worked on this. Uh, they look a bit unhappy, I don't know why. I, recent mathematicians are happier. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the area. Uh, so it, it's initially in the early 19th century, people started looking at, at, at those lattices mainly from number theory. I mean, that was math was mainly about that, and people cared about um, number theory and other applications. This started from Gauss in eight, um, 1801, uh, Hermit, uh, Minkowski. I think Minkowski is the one who really made the. Um, major progress in this in this area that, that you'll see some of it even today. You see Minkowski's here. Um, they cared about slightly different questions. They didn't care about crypto at that time, um, but their ideas are still used today. Um, so Gauss, Hermit, Minkowski, and many other mathematicians that uh, you might see later today. Um, so more recently, this is you know, 19th century. I'm going to tell you about slightly newer stuff. A more recent. Uh, a very important result is something that I guess everyone should know. It's something uh, called the LLL algorithm, the triple L algorithm, or L-cube algorithm, by Lenstra, Lenstra, and Lovas. And here is a picture. See, I promise a bit happier. I'm not sure if you can see that. They're cold, but they're happier. This is, um, I'm not sure if I can tell which one is which, but this is the two Lenstras and, and, uh, and Lovas. In 1982, when they uh, were working on this uh, algorithm, um, and the algorithm does something uh, pretty amazing. Um, so if, if you've never seen it before, it's really something that um, everyone should know. And tomorrow, Vadim will tell us more about this. Uh, it's, it can do you know, many amazing things. Uh, some of the applications, or at least the, the original uh, formulation of this, the original application is, uh, and this is the way we usually use it, is to what's known as approximate the shortest vector in, in the lattice. We'll see later what that means. Essentially. The algorithm is able to find vectors that are close to the origin. Uh, but the, actually, the original application was for something known as factoring, factoring um, polynomials over the rational numbers, um, and for solving uh, integer programs in, in a fixed dimension. This was a later paper by uh, Lenstra. Um, this is all amazing things. So factoring, what are factoring polynomials over the rational? So you have a polynomial and can factor into lower degree polynomials in case it's possible over the rationals. Um, another cool application is this. This is something you can do in, in I guess, in Mathematica or Maple. Um, you know, assume you have some calculation, some numerical calculation, you end up with this number, 6.73205. And you're kind of wondering, maybe it's a nice number. Maybe it's like square root of something, a cube root of some, something. Uh, any idea? Does it look familiar? Actually, this is a very easy example. Some of you might know. Okay, so this is yeah, this is square root three plus five turns out. But this is a very simple example. This is something you can easily do these days using the LA algorithm. But you can have you know any algebraic number, and you know you just type the number. And actually, this happened to me last week. Last week, I was running some uh, computing some integral and numerically because it was very complicated. And I was very happy to find out it's actually a square root of a square root of five plus four. So this thing really works, and this is a very nice application of the LL algorithm. We won't see it, but we'll see other things. Um, okay. So this is a bit about the history. This is still 80s, 1982. Um, more recently, and this is the focus of this middle school, uh, you know, people realize that lattices can also be used for crypto. So let me just say a few things about crypto, just in case you, know, you, you know, completely... Uh, jet lag and have no idea uh, whatsoever. So what is crypto? Well, crypto is currently uh, uh, you know, a big area. It's important for uh, economy, important for... It's everywhere, and credit cards, passports, mobile phones, internet, yeah, you knew that. I know you knew that. Um, and most systems these days are based on, on RSA, crypto system, um, and uh, these are uh, reversed. Uh, uh, Shamir and Edelman, actually, uh, Shamir in 1977, who, you know, who invented this crypto system, and this is um, the one we essentially all use today. 
Uh, and I guess part of the goal of Lattice Bits Crypto is to offer an alternative, and this is what we'll try to convince you the next um, four days, that there is there's a reason to look for alternatives and there's also um, a good alternative. Um, so I guess this is something we'll see in the next few days. I hope we'll manage to convince you. Uh, but not only that, there are many other reasons to look at uh, Lattice Bits Crypto. Um, okay, so this is this is the RSA crypto system, uh, which I'll mention again uh, later. And and I guess the, the, the first connections, the first connections between crypto and and uh, and lattices came shortly after the LLL algorithm. So people said, okay, we have this great algorithm, the LLL algorithm, and can do wonderful things. Maybe it can also be used to break all sorts of suggestions for crypto systems. And indeed, this, this, were, this is still, these days, one of the most important applications of the LL algorithm. So it can, it's really Marvin's algorithm, and it can break all sorts of suggested, proposed uh, crypto systems. For instance, NAPSEC, uh, certain NAPSEC-based crypto systems, um, worked by Lagarus on Listcoin, ID5, and more recently works on variants of RSA. There's um, Dan Bonet is working on this these days, um, so Hastad and Coppersmith. If you run RSA in certain strange configurations, it turns out you can break RSA uh, using, using the LL algorithm. This is quite nice work. Um, there's lots of, see lots of work in this area. But this is not actually what I will tell you about today. I don't think you'll see more of it, even though it's very nice. What we'll tell you about here in this, uh, in this Windows School is actually kind of positive applications. We'll tell you about how to, how to create crypto, how to do crypto using using LLL, using, sorry, using lattices, not using LLL. So. Um, okay, so this, this realization started in the mid-90s. This is work by, by uh, Aita in 1996. And this is, this is a really amazing idea, this breakthrough idea, and this is exactly the topic of our Windows School. How to, how to use this, this mathematical structure, these lattices, and, and their associated computational problems, how to use them for creating crypto, how to you know, create uh, public key crypto systems, one-way functions, and many, many, many other things. Um, this idea started in 1996. Uh, ITA is the first one to realize that. And why do we care about that? Why should we, you know, why should we do crypto using lattices? So this is something I tried to convince you here in this introduction. It turns out it has lots of nice features that um, we don't usually have using uh, other, other more traditional assumptions like factoring or, or discrete log. Uh, so it has strong notions of security. It's, uh, I, I'm saying here mathematically proven, but of course one should be careful. I, can, I can't prove that anything is secure. You know, if P equals NP or, you know, these things can all be insecure. Um, but still you can prove certain things. You can prove that these crypto systems are as hard as other problems, as certain lattice questions that we believe are very hard. So the, I'll talk about that in the next few slides. Another nice feature uh, is that these lattice-based crypto systems are resistant to attacks by quantum computers. So you know, by now, you, most of you um, uh, must have heard that quantum computers can break uh, factoring, can, can, can do discrete law, can do factoring, so it can, can break our say in particular. Uh, it can do many, many other things. And I would say among the only remaining candidates, uh, among the only remaining crypto systems that are still secure against quantum, I would say lattices rank quite high, maybe the highest. Uh, and this is you know, one of the main reasons uh, we are, we're trying to investigate this. Um, you know, there are no quantum computers these days. It's still uh, a thing of the future. It's still uh, under construction. But, you know, if, if, you, if you want to have crypto in 10 years, you should start worrying about this now, I think. Um, you know, who knows? We might have quantum computers in 10, 20 years. It's something we should worry about. Um, you know, and even if not, you know, the, the thing we transmit today should remain crypt encrypted for at least 10 years. It's, again, something we, we have to start worrying about today, I believe. Um, it's kind of serious because we really don't have so many alternatives. So if, if you look today, wh you know, what would happen if suddenly quantum computers are built? You know, we don't have so many alternatives. And it would be very hard to, to live without crypto. We kind of got used to this nice idea of typing our credit card um, you know, on a website. Um, and doing banking online. So it would be nice to, to have uh, an alternative, and this is one of the things we're trying to do. And kind of another advantage, which is something I'll mention later, in some cases, 
Lattice Build Script is even faster and you can offer more things, offer more functionalities. It's something we realized in the last few years. Um, I'll mention that in the, in the next few slides. Okay. So this, is, this is kind of uh, rough, very roughly why we care about lattices. And here's, here's an attempt just to show you very, very high level you know, how one does crypto. Well, why is there a, a chance to do crypto here? And uh, I, the, the very rough idea is that we, you know, we have this lattice and it's going to be in high dimensions. And not in, this is two dimensions, but it's going to be in high dimensions. And you know, think like dimension 500. And the idea is that you, know, you take a lattice point, so I take a random lattice point, like this one, and I would perturb it a bit, I move it there. Okay, so you know, I took it one there, move it a bit down, and now it's, it, seems, it seems very hard computationally to figure out that this point came from there. It's, figure, it's hard to figure out where the point comes from. In two dimensions it seems easy, but when you have 500 dimensions, there's you know, lots of places you can go, you can go you know, up, down, and the, the exponential many directions you can try to go, in, in, in high dimension. So this is, this is kind of where the hardness comes from, even though, to, to, you know, to be honest, you won't see that in the next few talks, because today these things are going to be encapsulated in, in sort of intermediate problems that you'll see. It's the SIS, the LWE problem, you'll see that in the, in the next few talks. So this, but this is kind of the idea underlying, uh, underlying lattice-based crypto. Okay. The crypto itself, you see, won't involve this, but, but it's just the underlying idea. Okay, so let me go a bit more detail on why, um, you know, what are some of the, you know, some of the advantages of, of lattice-based crypto. Um, so as I said, there's, there's this thing called provable uh, security. So, so the constructions we, we have usually associate with a certain proof, almost always these days. And the proof tells us that you know, if you break the crypto system, you know, if you're able to break the uh, public key encryption scheme, or you're able to invert the one-way function, even with some small, very small probability, then something amazing happens. And typically, it would be you can solve hard, hard lattice problems. Okay? And this is very nice because it really gives us, kind of, tells us that we're not you know, missing some, some obvious detail in the construction of the crypto system. We're not missing some, some uh, technicality or subtlety. We know that we can prove that if, you know, if you're able to break the system, then something really amazing happens. And this is very nice. I should say that usually in standard crypto, you don't always have that. Sometimes you have that, but you know, even for RSA, we don't know if it's breaking RSA implies factoring. So, you know, but uh, it's true that in crypto you sometimes have it, but not always. And in lattice based crypto, I would say it's typically this is the case, at least in, in you know, the last decade or so. That's usually what you get. Um, okay, so this is one advantage. A uh, second comparison. The comparison here is that. Um, the type of security you get, this is something I'll elaborate on in the next slide, is something very nice, something called worst case security. And this is really something that's quite unique to, to lattices. Um, this is something you don't usually see elsewhere. This is a very nice feature. Well, I'll mention this in the next two slides. So it's something that means that you know, if you're able to break the system, then you can solve the worst case problem. You can solve any instance of the lattice problem. I'll mention this in the next, in the next few slides. And in standard crypto, usually this doesn't happen. Uh, usually you get security based on certain average case problem. I'll mention why this is important in the next slide. This is, this is a very nice advantage. This was one reason why ITA's work in, in the mid-90s attracted so much attention. This was really a new, a new idea, a new notion. It's, it's a pretty amazing thing. Um, okay, here I guess this is my own biased view of why this is an advantage. But for me, this is an advantage because here we're based on lattice problems. It's a new problem. Uh, compared to factoring, but still it's, you know, it's been around for, uh, actually if you take into account the work of mathematicians, it's been around for two decades, uh, for two centuries, but in the computer science it's already been around for three decades, it's an established problem, um, and uh, it has another advantage of you know, not being broken by quantum algorithms, so you know, we kind of have good confidence in this problem, this really hard problem, we can base script on it, um, and yeah, it's, it's not broken by quantum algorithms. Of course, I don't know, but it's, you know, this is a big open question to find quantum algorithms for, for these lattice problems. It's been around um, you know, for more than 15 years, and, and there hasn't been any progress on that. So it's, it seems like it's very hard, uh, and probably it's, it's hard for quantum algorithms as well. Um, and maybe the one thing I should say uh, is that if you actually look at the kind of crypto systems you get, um, you know, if you do 
systems based on factoring, you always have to do some multiplications, exponentiations, you know, which is maybe not a big deal for a laptop, but for small uh, devices like you know uh, smart cards, this does require quite a lot of effort. Okay, this all these multiplications and exponentiation is one of the nice things. If you do uh, lattice-based crypto, there's really not much going on. It's mainly additions. You're just doing a bunch of additions, and especially in the recent years, due to work. Um, Due to some work in the recent years, we, there are some proposals of extremely efficient uh, lattice-based crypto. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. You really don't do anything. You just sum a bunch, a bunch of numbers. You sum them up, and, and that's all you do. So, you know, even in the in the efficiency front, it seems like lattices are doing quite well. Uh, and one last thing is that, and this is mainly due to uh, work in recent years uh, of my. Uh, colleagues here of uh, Vadim, of Chris and Craig, we realize Lattice can do more things. There are lots of amazing things we can do using Lattice we couldn't do otherwise. For instance, the fully homomorphic encryption, um, this is something Craig will tell you a lot about on Tuesday and Wednesday, which is you know, really an amazing breakthrough. That, you know, things you can do using Lattice which we couldn't do before. And this is something in the mid-90s no one dreamed that this can be possible. No one, no one dreamed that this can be no one dreamt that one can take lattices and do things that we could do using factoring. You know, people thought factoring and number theoretic assumptions are as strong as, uh, as it gets, but it turns out you can do lots of things using, using lattices too. Okay, I hope by now you're convinced uh, that this, it's worth listening to uh, the rest of this middle school. I, um, uh, let me just tell you a bit about this, kind of these issues a bit more in detail. Um, the first thing is about provable security. As I said, I mean, we're not really proving that something is secure. No one can prove that. If P equals MP, everything breaks. But, but, but the reason that, uh, what provable security is about is about con connecting the, the cryptographic construction to something that you already know and love and trust. Okay? So this is, it's a reduction. It's a reduction from um, an established hard problem, and not a problem that just came up this morning, uh, but a new, uh, an established hard problem. To a set to, to your cryptographic function. Okay, so this is this is a security proof, and this, this is something you really want to have. Um, I'll mention maybe later. This is, you know, in several instances, this really um, this really helped um, and, and it gave us kind of the hints on what we should we should be doing. So I'll mention this in the next few points here. Um, so it tells us that we're not doing anything stupid. It tells us that the crypto system, if if the crypto system is Broken. If there's, um, you know, there's an attacker that can attack it with even small probability, then something amazing happens. Namely, our um, hard problem is not no longer hard. Um, so, you know, the whole our whole assumption is broken. Not only our crypto system is no longer secure, but you know, also all other constructions based on that problem. So this is something you know very nice to have. This is something that we always want to have. Don't always get, but with that is based crypto, as you see essentially always get such a strong uh, security guarantee. This is really something very nice. Um, it kind of tells us that we're doing the right thing. Okay? So if you have this crazy idea, let's try to construct this crypto system. You, you first see if, it's, if, it's, if you have a security proof, if you're connected to something already known, you're connected to a hard problem, then you know you're going the right way. Okay? Um, it's not like you might have you know, forgotten to add five somewhere, and then because of that, everything is broken. And maybe I'll mention, without a security proof, this can happen, and we, we see some of the, those. Uh, we see one example like that on Tuesday. Okay, well, you know, you don't have a security proof, but you think everything is secure, right? You construct a crypto system, everything seems fine, you think about it for a long time, but there's nothing that connects it to uh, an established problem, then you know, problems can happen. And um, I'll mention, we'll mention some of that later in, the, this, in this week. Uh, Another nice thing, maybe uh, we might mention, I hope Chris will mention later today, it can also give us hints as to choice of parameters. And this, is, this also relates to my next point. So you have the script system, but, but there are some parameters, like you know, um, you know, the, the, the size of a certain number should be bigger than some other number. And often you don't know how to choose these numbers, but if you have some proof of security, then the proof of security tells you that for the proof of security to work, you know, m should be bigger than n squared. Then you say, maybe we should really take m to be bigger than n squared to make the security proof work. And there's one nice instance of this that happened in history. We, you know, we, uh, maybe Chris will mention that. We had, we had a security proof, and the security proof told us a certain parameter has to be bigger than square root n. Um, we didn't know why, 
but we, we said, okay, let's use this parameter big in square root n. We didn't know why at the time, but um, like five years later came an algorithm that showed that if this parameter is smaller than square root n, you can break the system in sub-exponential time. I hope Chris will mention uh, this later today. So this, this kind of tells you uh, the strength of something like a security proof. It tells you, really tells you what, you know, what kind of, uh, what's the right thing to do. It tells you that you're going in the, down the right path. Okay, so let me just mention one example of, of, of what security proof might look like. And this will bring us to the next point, to the, to the issue of uh, worst case, average case hardness. Um, just a very simple example uh, of, of a one-way function uh, based on um, modular squaring, just to give an illustration of this idea. So, assume I want to construct the, the, the following one-way function. The one-way function is squares, simply squares the numbers. It takes x and, and outputs x squared. Okay. So the way I do it, well, let's let capital N be some product of two large primes. I don't know how to choose it. This will be, I'll mention uh, more about that in a minute. So choose somehow a capital N, a product of two big primes. And now consider the function simply squares x and reduces modulo capital N. Okay? So you know, it's a nice exercise um, you know, to show that you know, being able to invert this function, being able to find pre-images of this function uh, on the randomly chosen x. So I give you x squared for randomly chosen x, ask you to find a pre-image meaning find any x prime whose um, uh, uh, value was, was mapped to, that's mapped to x squared, then it's easy to show, a uh, nice exercise, that you know, if you can do that, if you can find pre-images, then you can also factor capital N. Okay, so this is one example of a security proof, because it shows that if you're able to invert this function, even with small probability, even probability 1%, or any non-negligible probability, you can factor capital N. Yes, you know, if you forgot how to do that or you haven't seen it yet, try to think about that. But there's actually one point I'm trying to make here. So we have a security proof, and this is actually quite good. It shows us that at least this is related to factoring, so this is not such a bad uh, one-way function. Um, but still, th this, and this brings me to the next point, this function, this, this uh, security proof is what I would call average case, uh, based on average case hardness. And the reason it's based on average case hardness is because of this capital N. I didn't tell you how to choose capital N, and you should have asked me, you know, how should I choose capital N? Um, I told you to take N uh, equal to, to be the product of two large primes, but is there anything else you should know? Should the primes satisfy some properties? Are the good primes bad primes? Um, and this is not such a obvious, there's no obvious answer to that, uh, I would say. I think it's, it's a, a serious, uh, uh, this is a good question. And this kind of um, brings me to the next story, which is, how do you choose capital N? Let's say you do RSA, you want to you know, write um, the code for RSA, how do you choose the, the modulus, the capital N? So, okay, so, you know, if you... You know, if you took a course about that, you know it should be even, right? If you take n to be even, that's a bad idea. So you want to take it a product of two primes, two large primes. Okay, this is kind of the basic thing you usually learn. But is that all, though? Maybe there are some primes better than others. What do you think? Do you know what are good primes to take? <laughs> Safe primes. Any other proposals? Yeah, so it's, it's a good question. Uh, I don't think we really know the answer, but let me tell you what did happen in history. Um, at least in 1978, you know, people realized, so people worked on algorithm for factoring, right? RSA came out and people realized factoring is an important problem, so they tried to find algorithm for factoring. And in 1978, people realized there's, um, that there's an efficient algorithm when the uh, you know, largest prime factors of P minus one or Q minus one are small, so people said, okay, if you want to prevent attacks using this kind of attack, you should choose P and Q such that P minus one and Q minus one are large, uh, have large, uh, the largest prime factor are large, okay, they shouldn't be smooth. Okay, so this was 1978, um, fine, so you add that to your code, you add this check, it's usually okay, but you, anyway, you add that thing to check that P and Q are fine. Good, so next thing, 18.1, Another paper comes out, again, efficient algorithm for another special case. P plus one now in, in Q minus one, they should have large prime factor. Okay, good. So then you add another line to your code to make sure this also happens. 
no, two years, one year passed actually, and there's another paper, and now the loudest prime factors of p minus one and q minus one, if they are p prime and q prime, then you really want p prime minus one and q prime minus one to also have large prime factors. Okay, you check that too, um, and you can guess what comes next. 1984, um, the large prime factor of p plus one, q minus one, this is p prime and q prime, then now we want those to also have, I mean, p prime minus one, q prime minus one, to have large prime factors. Okay, so maybe you didn't, you never saw this before, and the reason you, you haven't seen it before um, is because these days we have much more efficient factoring algorithms, right? The, the number field C um, was discovered. So actually, today, these four results are no longer relevant. We have much more efficient factoring algorithms, and those, at least as far as we know, those seem to perform equally well you know, for all capital N um, of the form P times Q, at least as, as far as I know. Maybe there's still some differences for certain P's and Q's. But, you know, it's not necessarily the end of the story. I, I'm, I'm not an expert in number theory, but, you know, uh, in a few years, people might come up with more efficient implementations. And I believe there might still be, for certain, very certain choices of, of um, the primes, there might be more efficient algorithms. So there's a, there's a real issue here, how to choose this parameter, capital N. And why is this... Why is there this issue here? This is because of the kind of security proof we had. We have um, breaking a crypto system, breaking RSA, doesn't mean that you can factor. It just means that you can factor, well, it doesn't even mean that, but it essentially means you do something non-trivial with a very certain capital N, with a specific capital N, not with all of them, with a very specific capital N. Okay, and this is, this is what we call average case hardness. Okay, so to believe that RSA and other systems based on factoring are hard, what you need to believe is that factoring is hard um, on the average case. Uh, you need to believe, uh, you need to, to believe not just um, that it's hard to factor all numbers, um, but it's hard to factor even a small fraction of them. Okay? So it might be, this might be a hypothetical situation where there's 1% of all numbers that are easy to factor, and then you know, it breaks RSA because 1% of keys are factored. Um, but still, it's hard to factor a worst-case number. So maybe some numbers with certain structures we can factor, but not all numbers. This is exactly the kind of thing that's bothering me here, and this is the kind of thing that lattices don't suffer from. This is why you know, one of the main advantages is the worst-case hardness that lattices enjoy. And let me try to kind of pictorially explain this again. You know, if you're doing a security proof based on average case hardness, it looks something like that. So you have this parameter, capital N, and on the right-hand side, you have the cryptographic function based on capital N, and it looks just like kind of, um, you know, a bijection, just like a one-to-one -one correspondence. For each um, um, capital N, you show that you can map it to a cryptographic function with the same parameter, capital N, such that if the cryptographic function is broken, then you can factor capital N. But it's really just kind of a one-to-one -one bijection. So if, you know, suddenly, the, crypto, the cryptographic system is broken, meaning, say, with probability 1%, um, the cryptographic system is broken, all you get is that 1% of all capital numbers, capital N, 1% all, all of, of all numbers capital N are broken, are factored. But that doesn't mean that you can factor all of them. You know? It only means you can factor 1% of them. This is exactly the kind of thing we have uh, when this is, this is exactly the kind of thing where we can uh, improve using analysis, and this is what's known as worst case hardness. Okay, so, what's, what's worst case hardness? You know, the, the security, um, the security mapping, the security proof looks more like a, a complete graph in some sense. You take, you take any lattice here on the left hand side. And, and, and you map it to the right-hand side, you map it to, to a cryptographic function, it's mapped to a uniform cryptographic function. Okay, it looks, looks pretty amazing, and, and the next talk, Vadim will show you how this is, this is done, this, this magic. But this is really, this is really the, the main idea of, of worst-case hardness. That in some sense, you can map any lattice problem, well, uh, any instance, I should say, any instance of that problem, any lattice, you can map to a uniform distribution on this cryptographic Function. This is just a pretty amazing. So what it says again, if you have, if now you have one percent of your cryptographic functions broken, meaning with probability one percent the cryptographic function is broken, then any instance of this lattice problem, any lattice can be now solved, can be can be broken. And this is nice in several respects. First, it's just it's a it's a strong security guarantee, right? Um, but 
it's not only a strong security guarantee, but also it, it tells you don't have to worry anymore about how to choose capital N. There's really no, you don't have to worry about choosing the distribution. It tells you that you should, just there's a natural distribution here that you should work with, and security proof tells you what the distribution is, and you can just work with it. You don't have to start worrying what's the right capital N, what's the bad capital N. Okay, so it really tells you that, you know, this is, you know, this is what you should be working with. Okay. So, let me just say, this was kind of um, introduction, this was introduction to the area. I should just say one more thing before, um, before I go to the more technical part. Uh, this is kind of a more recent history. You know, what happened in the last um, decade and a half. So, as I said, the big breakthrough, the seminar work was of Aita and Aita work in 1996, and they realized that you can do <laughs> lots of nice things, you can do amazing things using lattices. Um, they showed how to do uh, one wave functions, um, they showed how to do uh, public key crypto system. Th but these were, I would say, mainly uh, proof of concept. They showed that these things are achievable, they showed how to obtain worst case security guarantees. Um, um, but if you look from a practical side, these things were still extremely inefficient. Uh, I would say, you know, to actually use the systems, you would have keys of, of gigabytes, which is you know, not so nice or extremely slow, cumbersome. And it seemed like it should be, you know, these things seemed like they should be mainly of theoretical interest. This is kind of what has changed in the last few years. Um, where these days we really have you know, very efficient constructions that are competitive, competitive with things like, um, even things like RSA. Um, so, it also seems like it's very hard to use these things, it's very hard to extend to do other things. You know, just doing public key encryption, the most basic, you know, most basic um, chosen, uh, most basic uh, public key crypto system seemed already quite, quite difficult. Even just chosen plain text uh, attack seemed quite difficult. Uh, and extending it seemed very uh, almost impossible. And then more recent work tried to kind of, um, identify and improve this idea and refine them. And, and I'd say in, in recent years we kind of uh, converged to two central problems, which is will be the topic of the next two talks. Will be uh, Vadim will talk about the short integer solution problem, and then Chris will talk about the learning with errors problem. And, and these problems allowed. Finally, to, allowed to construct, allowed to construct very efficient uh, constructions, very, very efficient crypto systems, very efficient one-way functions, and they also allow us to abstract away all the lattice stuff. Now, when you when you trying to do lattice-based crypto, you don't have directly to work with the worst-case security proof. You just base it on one of these intermediate problems, either the SIS or LWE, and you know take it from there. And someone already did all the hard work for you. you someone already did the the worst case hardness proof for you, you just have to take it from there and use this to construct crypto system. There's still lots of hard work from there too, but at least part of the work has already been done. And this will be the topic of the next two talks. So this is one main line of work in the recent years. Um, and in, in parallel, there's another line of work, which we will see, I guess, on Tuesday. Vadim will tell us about Tuesday. And this is, so this was, I, I said here, this, this are very efficient, and here this, I would say this extremely efficient uh, systems, um, and they're based on um, certain structured, what uh, structured lattices. These are problems we call the ring LWE or ring SIS, and this started with work of uh, uh, Michancho in 2002, and then uh, uh, Chris Pikert and Alon Rosen in 2006, and Lubashevsky and Michancho in 2006. They, they, they realized that if you consider certain types of lattices, not the most general lattices, but lattices that are like cyclic lattices that have some structure, um, then you can make everything much more efficient. You get a quadratic improvement, and this construction really kind of truly uh, uh, efficient. I would say you know, keys of size like uh, maybe kilobytes, um, something of that that order of magnitude. Um, uh, you know, even um, competitors in a, in, a comp in a competition for hash functions. I guess Vadim will tell us more about this on on Tuesday. Okay. So this was of the introduction. Before I go to the technical part, we actually have to uh, again power on the brain. Uh, any any questions? Okay. So uh, good.
for example, uh, short vexes problem, they are, what is known about the, how hard they are? Okay, so the question was, question was uh, how hard are certain problems like shortest vector problem? I'll mention this in the next part. You'll see, I'll get to the more technical uh, slides and we'll see what kind of problems we are dealing with. Yeah. But if I don't answer your question, ask me again. Okay. So this part is slightly more technical, but still this is something um, should be okay, even those coming from the... Uh, uh, US. Uh, let's start again. Equal definition. This is this. Uh, um, this is what uh, a lattice is. So a lattice is uh, the set of all integer combinations of n linearly independent vectors. Um, so we have v1 up to vn. We call those vectors the bases, and we take all the integer combinations. This is what we call a lattice. Okay. And. Um, a notation that we'll use in, uh, in this um, notation we use is, is L of B. B is the, we usually think of it as a matrix whose columns are simply the basis vectors. Okay, so B is an N, um, N times N matrix and the columns are V1, V2 up to Vn. Okay, and so this is the notation we'll use. This is the lattice generated by B, by the basis B. Okay, and um, there's another way to define a lattice, kind of a more um, uh, cleaner way, mathematically cleaner way to define it without talking about the basis, and this is uh, as a discrete additive subgroup of R to the N. Okay, so what does it mean? Um, so what's an additive subgroup? It's simply a set of a subset of R to the N, such that you know whenever you say, add two points, you're still in that set. Okay, so it's it's closed under say addition. Um, and it should also be discrete. Discrete means essentially the, the points have some space between them. They're not dense. Um, so each point has some neighborhood around it that's, that's where it's alone. And the reason we put discrete is because otherwise we would have things like, say, the, the rational numbers. They are an additive subgroup of the real numbers, but they're not considered a lattice because they're dense. Okay? So we want something that looks like that, that has some spacing between the points. So this is uh, an equivalent definition. If you want, you can think about showing the equivalence. It's not too important. You can just you know, remember that the first definition. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning the other one is because sometimes we would define lattices without telling you what the basis is. I'll just tell you, for instance, take all points satisfying certain, or say take all integer points satisfying a certain constraint. For instance, all integer points, all integer points whose sum is zero modulo five. Okay, so this is a lattice, and you don't immediately see what the basis is. You can think about it, you'll find the basis, but you can immediately see that it's a discrete additive subgroup. Okay? So sometimes it's easier to work with this definition, but you know, for, for most purposes, think of, of the first one, it's good enough. Okay. Good. Okay, so uh, let's have a closer look at the, uh, how bases generate lattices. So here's um, here is a picture. Uh, for instance, I take these two vectors. I take kind of the standard basis vectors, one comma zero and zero comma one. Okay, you know what kind of base, what kind of lattice generate? So it doesn't take long to see that if you take all integer multiples of this guy, and you know, and all integer multiples of these guys, and you kind of add them up, you get all the integer points. Okay, that should be pretty obvious. You get the standard lattice. You get z squared. Um, you know, the, the, the standard two-dimensional lattice of integers. Okay. So this is you know, one example. The other example over there, you have two different vectors. I took two different vectors, 2 comma 1 and 1 comma 1, and kind of surprisingly they generate the same lattice. Okay, so you, you think about it for a second, you see why. For instance, you take um, 2 comma 1, subtract 1 comma 1, you get a vector 1 comma 0. Okay, and you know, you can, similarly you can get anywhere in that lattice of integer points. And the first question we try to answer is why? Why are these two bases the same? This you'll see in the next in the next slide. Okay, try to think about why are they why do they generate the same lattice? So these are two different bases. Uh, the vectors are different length, but somehow they generate the same lattice. Another example where we don't get the same lattice is this. You take the vector two comma zero and, and one comma one, and you get this checkerboard like lattice. So you get only um, you know you only get the points whose sum is even. Okay, so it's, so it's, a different, it's a different lattice. Um, why? This is the question we try to answer next. 
you know, why are these two bases the same? How do we know if I, you know, if I give you two bases, how do we know if you generate the same lattice or not? So it turns out you can do that. It's computationally feasible. It's uh, even easy to do that. Um, this is the question I'll try to answer now. So when do two bases generate, um, generate the same lattice? So let's try to think what kind of things we can do with, uh, with the basis while keeping the same lattice. So if I have a basis v1, v2 up to vn, you know, what, can I, what can I do with the basis and, and not change the lattice? <coughs> so this is really the last thing. But first, kind of trivial things you won't even say, I guess. So the first thing I would say, you know, probably you won't even su suggest this, is kind of a permute. I can, if I have v1, v2 up to vn, I have a sequence of n vectors. I can, of course, permute them. I can change the order of the vectors, you know, they give the same lattice. Okay, that's not surprising. Fine, okay. Um, another thing that's maybe not so surprising is they can, you can negate a vector, right? I can take um, vi and replace it with minus vi. If you think about this, it's exactly the same lattice because the integer combinations using vi are exactly the same as using minus vi, right? You just have to negate the coefficients, so you know, it's exactly the same lattice. Right? Can I replace vi by twice vi? No, that doesn't work anymore. I cannot just multiply a vector by 2. That would create a partial lattice. We saw that in the previous slide, I guess we saw, or something like that we saw. And if I would have 1, 0 and 1, 1, I would get all integers, but once I have 2, 0 and 1, 1, I only get the checkerboard. I only get kind of half of the points. Okay. Good, so we cannot multiply by 2, but there's, there is something we can do, and this is the only missing operation here, and this would be the same, a similar step to what you do in Gaussian elimination. You add one vector to another. So this is an operation you can do. You can Oh, it's not good. Okay, so I um, should have used my laptop. Um, so you can add, but this is easy, this is the integer numbers. So you can take uh, vi and add k times vj to vi. Okay, so if I have, um, um, for any two vectors in the basis vi and vj, I can take an integer multiple of vj and add it to vi. Okay, now let's try to think why this doesn't change anything in the lattice. Any vector I can create using the previous vectors, I can also create using the new vectors. Because now, assume I want to, in a previous lattice, I had something using 5 times vi. So now I'm going to use 5 times of this new vector, 5 times of vi plus kvj. And then I'll subtract minus 5, uh, so I'll, I'll subtract 5k vj in order to get back to the same vector. Okay, so it's an easy exercise. You'll have more such exercises in the, um, in the homework. Uh, but this is, this is another thing you can do. Okay, so I can kind of add a multiple of, integer multiple of one column to another. Anything else you can do? Well, if you look at the printed slide, you know that there's not. Um, but if you don't look, you might be surprised that this is essentially all you can do, and there's a more succinct way to describe what's going on here. So these three operations we discussed here, if you think about it more mathematically, what's happening here, we're essentially allowing you to multiply the matrix B from the right-hand side by certain matrices. We do column operations. Notice all these things are only column operations, so we only act from the right-hand side. And the kind of operations we can do is permute, this corresponds to a matrix and we have two ones on the off diagonals. Um, we can negate. This corresponds to uh, matrices minus one on the diagonal and ones everywhere else. Okay. So if you kind of think what kind of matrices these operations represent, you realize that um, you end up with matrices that are integer matrices that have determinant either one or minus one. And in fact, you end up with all such matrices. This requires a proof. I'm not going to do here. And these matrices are called unimodular matrices. So this is the, maybe the first uh, idea, the first uh, real idea I want to uh, convey here. So again, what are unimodular matrices? Um, these are integer matrices that have determinants either plus or minus one. Okay. Um, 
if you haven't seen them before, this is, this is um, you know, it's an interesting uh, group of matrices. It's closed under multiplication, of course. Uh, what's nice about these matrices is that their inverse is also in a geometric, right? You can try to prove that. Um, you know, usually, if you take an inverse of an integer matrix, it's not going to be it's not going to be integer. But the inverse of this matrix is also integer, um, and this actually relates to the property that I mentioned in a minute. Um, and this actually is easy to prove. So if you remember anything about linear algebra, you can try to prove it now that the inverse of unimodular matrix is also an integer matrix. In fact, it's also unimodular. And in fact, this is also this is the equivalent definition of unimodular matrix. An integer matrix whose inverse is also Integer. Okay, so lots of definitions of this notion. And another definition, all matrices you can generate by repeating these operations. This, this appears in the, in the homework. So unimodular matrices essentially correspond to these kind of operations um, you can do on, on lattices, on, on, on basis, I should say, on basis elements. So maybe to summarize, I didn't, I didn't prove that because this is a tiny bit tedious, but it's not difficult. Okay, so you can try to prove that. Um, and the, the theorem, again, which I'm not going to prove, says that if you have two bases, B1 and B2, um, again, I think of them as matrices whose columns are the basis elements, so they're equivalent if and only if you can write B2 as B1 times U for a unimodular matrix U. Okay? So, you know, once you have the theorem, you should be able to guess, you know, how to check, how to check if two Bases are identical, are, are generate the same lattice or not. How to check if two bases, P1, B2, um, generate the same lattice. So think about it, we'll get to this question. It's, you know, it should be obvious from this theorem, and you can also prove it in, in other ways. Uh, so, I uh, started to lose characters, but so we'll use your imagination to complete the missing characters. I hope the printouts are in better quality. Probably not. Um, okay. Uh, it won't get much worse, I think. I think it's not. Let's say it's fine. Lots of pictures, and you know, I'll just give you the conversion. Uh, I think we'll, be, we'll do fine. It's not in the break. I'll change. Uh, so, so. So far, we only discussed kind of the very, very basics. We saw, uh, we saw lattice bases. What I'd like to describe now is actually something uh, quite important, something very basic. It's something that um, is used all over the place, but somehow it's um, difficult. It's very confusing at first, and, um, and I think it's very good to get used to it now. Uh, and you know, you'll see lots of it in, in Vadim's talk. Um, so again, it's a, it's a kind of a very basic notion, but somehow conceptually it takes time to get used to, to really be able to work with it and feel comfortable with it takes some time. And this is, the, what I'm trying to describe here is what's known as the torus of a lattice. Um, uh, it's, it's, so let me try to motivate this by something you, you're all familiar with. And these are periodic functions on the line, on the, on the one-dimensional um, reliner. Um, so, okay, let's complete the, the blank. So uh, f is a function from the, from the reals to the reals, from r to r. And assume it's periodic, has a period of 2 pi. So here's an example of a function, a function with a period of 2 pi. Okay? Um, and, you know, assume I ask you to, you know, I'm just trying to motivate this, assume I ask you to store the function. I ask you, you know, write a computer program that stores this function. Okay? So, you know, if you... Just have this as an, a homework exercise. You don't really care. You just store the values, you know, in all these points here. Assume there's some very fine grid here. You just store the values. But now you think, okay, let's be a bit smarter. Maybe I don't really need to store all the functions, all the values of the function, because you know it repeats itself. You know, why store, you know, zero and two pi and four pi, and because they're all the same value. The function is periodic. And then, then you think, okay, maybe uh, I won't be that stupid. Maybe I'll try to store only one period. Okay, it's a, it's a, I'm saying something very basic, and indeed that's what you would do, right? You would just store one period of the function. Okay, it's very obvious, but in a minute it won't be that obvious. That I want to emphasize this. Okay. So enough to store just the values on the interval zero up to two pi. Okay. So I only store the values here. And now, if I want to know, you know, I ask you, you know, what's the value of the function at point ten? 
So you, know, you, you, you want to know the function of point 10, so you think what point here in the interval maps to 10. What you essentially do, what you're essentially doing is reducing 10 modulo 2 pi. Okay, so you get you know, 10 minus 2 pi will bring you somewhere here, and then you compute the value of the function. Okay, you see the value of the function is here. Okay, not, you know, not, not too amazing, I guess you would all do that. Um, but when you're going to higher dimensions, this becomes slightly trickier, slightly more interesting. Um, uh, I should say, mathematically, what's happening here, one way to say what's happening here is the function f is it's not really defined on all the real lines, it's just defined on the cycle, it's defined on the real line modulo 2 pi z. Yeah? So it's a real line when you reduce it modulo 2 pi uh, times the integers. So this, this creates what's known as a cycle, um, it's, a, it's a group, okay, the group um, that's uh, essentially addition modulo 2 pi. It's a cyclic group. And that's what's essentially happening here. Okay? So we're only storing the values on, on one period. Okay? And of course, you could also do it if you wish. You could do store another period, like you can store that period. You know, you can store from from four to four plus two pi. Why? I mean, you can do that. It's it's as good, right? You could um, still store that segment. And now, if you want to figure out the value of a certain point, again, you have to reduce it modulo two pi, and then I guess add four, and then you figure out where is the representative of that point in the interval. Okay. So notice, um, I'm I'm, I'm uh, I'm insisting on this one-dimensional example because in higher dimensions everything just becomes more confusing. Let's notice what we, we have, what we are supposed to do here when we store this function. The idea, the basic idea, is to store just one representative of each coset of each shift of two pi z. That's the basic idea. This interval, what this interval does, storing kind of the essence of the function, stores exactly one point of each representative. Okay. And this, this idea is exactly what we will try to do in higher dimensions. Okay. So this brings us, okay, now I guess I have to uh, move on and show you what happens in two, two dimensions. But is that, is that any questions here? Is that, is that clear? Okay, so this is, again, in one dimension there's really no flexibility, you kind of have to choose an interval, you can maybe shift it around, but you still have to choose an interval. As you see now, in higher dimensions there's much more flexibility, and that's what makes it confusing, even though it shouldn't, because it's really the same idea. There's, there's nothing deeper going on. Okay, I have this nice uh, wallpaper-like uh, pattern, and think of it as a function now from the plane to, say, colors, like, say, 0, 1, black and white. Okay, so it's, now you're trying to store an image. Now you have a two-dimensional image, and you're trying to store it. And again, the image, you know, it's periodic, so it would be kind of strange to store all this, you know, store all these points um, of the image, right? So you only want to store the essence of the picture, only store one, one period. Okay, so how would you do that? So you could try to store that area. So I'm going to cut an area, a square, and as you can see, this area already has all the information of the pattern. Because now if I take this, this, I take this square and I'll you know, copy it all over the place, I get the whole function. Okay? So the square nicely captures one period of, of, this, of this lattice. This, this lattice is z squared, now I took the square, um, you know, 0, 1 squared, so this is the, the standard square on the plane, um, and you know, this is all you need to store, this square. Good. And, as before, the, the, reason this work is, this, the, the reason this works is because now if I want to figure out the value of my image, I want to figure out you know, some point here, you know, I can do that. I just, I find the point in the square that's um, analogous to that, to that, to, the, to my point. Okay, what I do I essentially reduce to that square. I will show mathematically how this happens. Uh, essentially, in this case, I just reduce modulo one each coordinate. Okay, and what I'm trying to demonstrate here, <laughs> If I manage, yeah. So what I'm trying to demonstrate here, I guess the colors don't really work out fine, uh, but that each coset, each shift of, of the lattice has exactly one point inside my period. You don't expect to see this animation in the printout. Right? I see some of you trying there. This, it won't work. So here's the idea again. So there's, this, there's the lattice, and now I'm trying to shift it. And, and the idea is that, whoop, let's do it again. See, each time there's exactly one point inside the square. 
Okay, it's not, not a coincidence. This is the way, um, this is exactly the way we reconstructed it. But this means that you know, for any point in the plane, there'll be, for instance, the point here, there'll be the analogous point here. Okay, when you reduce modulo that square. Okay, this this idea. So it's, it's a very simple idea, but it gets a bit confusing. This is for for the next for the following reason that you could actually work with a completely different period. It doesn't have to be a square. I could take, for instance, this shape here uh, and work, work with it instead. Okay? Now, if you look at it, there's nothing wrong with this shape. It's as good as the previous one. If you only store the values inside it, inside this shape, and now you repeat this pattern all over the place, you get exactly the same thing. There's really nothing wrong with this one. This shape, just like the previous one, is what we call a fundamental region. It's a fundamental region of the lattice. It's, it's a region that it contains exactly one representative of each corset. Okay. Again, it's, as before, if I now try to shift the, the lattice take corsets, you'll see, or you should be able to see, that you, each time you get exactly one point inside. Okay, so the points are a bit fat, but other than that, you should get one, exactly one point inside at each given moment. Yeah, I'm not cheating, it's, it's really, it really works. So this is, again, this is a fundamental, fundamental region. Now let's try to do it a bit um, more mathematically. And here's the, here's the way we do it more mathematically. Okay. So the two fundamental regions we saw are actually very specific ones. They're called fundamental parallel pipids because they are uh, what's known as a parallel pipid. Um, you know, in two dimensions we call it uh, a parallelogram, but in higher dimensions it's called a parallel pipid. So it's simply, it's simply the, 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 the body that's given by combinations of n linearly independent vectors with coefficients between 0 and 1. So let's see it again. Um, for each basis, for each given basis, you can define what's known as the fundamental parallel pipette. And the way it's defined is again, I, have, I take a basis, take a basis B, and the P of B, the parallel pipette given by B, is simply the set of all points given us combinations um, of, of B1 up to Bn with coefficients between 0 and 1. So for instance here, this is this great area here, we simply get a square, and if I take a different basis of the same lattice, I get a different shape, I get this parallelogram over there. Okay. And both these regions are fundamental regions, because if I, sh I translate them and I put one on each lattice point, I get a tessellation, I get a tiling of the whole of the whole plane. So you see how, how it's done here, so take the square and I'll repeat it for each of the lattice points, for each translation, and you get a nice tessellation of the whole plane. And same thing over there, I take this parallelogram and I, and I repeat it over, all, over, all over the plane, you know, and I get the whole plane. Okay? So again, I just put one of these guys at each lattice point, you know, and it nicely covers the plane. It's actually not surprising if you think about the definition, right? The lattice points are those that have integer coefficients here. The, paral the parallel pipe it has coefficients between 0 and 1. And once you add them, you get all real coefficients. Okay? So you get essentially all the entire space, and entire r to the n. So this is, this is the fundamental parallel pipe it, and I just you know, proved that it's actually a fundamental region. It, it has this property that it contains exactly one element of each coset. And the, the operation that finds the representative is, is known as reduction modulo the parallel pipe. This is something that <laughs> Vadim will repeat and use again in his talk. And, and the way you do it is, is, is very simple. If I have a point, any point in space, now the A's can be any real numbers. So I have point X, that's A1, B1, plus A2, B2, and so on up to A and BN. Now A, AIs are arbitrary, arbitrary real numbers. The operation of reducing modulo this parallel pipe, reducing modulo P of B, is simply outputting the point obtained by reducing these coefficients modulo 1. So I reduce the A's modulo 1. So I output A1 mod 1 times B1 plus A2 mod 1 times B2 and so on up to AN mod 1 times BN. Okay? Let's see it here. Let's see the picture what happens. And 
assume I have the point over there, and as before, I want to figure out you know, what's the value of the image there, what's the value of my function there. And what I do, I reduce modular parallel pi bit, I take modulo 1 each of the coefficients, and I end up in this point here. And you can see this point is in the same position relative to the lattice. That's the idea. The idea is to bring me to a position that's same, in the same position relative to the lattice, or equivalently, the difference between the points is the lattice point. It's, it's equivalent, one can equivalently define it like that. Let's do the same thing over there. Um, take the same point now, it's exactly the same point, and now reduce it modulo a different parallel pipe, the parallel pipe given by the different bases there, by the bases 2, 1, 1, 1, and I'll end up with a different point. Okay, I guess it's not the same point, but of course it's still in the same position relative to the lattice. So it's, I simply end up with a different representative, but it doesn't matter, it's still uh, you know, in the same coset, it still, it still has a difference uh, of a lattice vector from the original point. So why is this useful, actually? Why is this, all this story useful? Uh, you, see, you see this in, in Vadim's talk, but maybe just to already tell you now, um, we actually most often, we, it's not for storing a periodic function. You could do it if you want to store an image, you can do it, it's, it works very well. But usually what we like to do, we like to analyze a position of the position of points relative to a lattice. So we will have a bunch of points, and we'd like to know where they are relative to the lattice. For instance, we'd like to know if a point is in the lattice. Okay, but we don't really care about where the point is. We just care if where the point is relative to the lattice. So what we'll do, we'll reduce it modulo p of b. We'll reduce it modulo any basic parallel pipe. Um, for instance, a point is in a lattice if and only if once you reduce it modulo p of b, you get the zero point. You get the origin. Okay, you can see it because a point is in the lattice if and only if it has integer coefficients, right? And if you reduce it mod one, you get the zero point because all the integer coefficients become zero. Okay. So again, this is, an, this is one thing that Vadim will use: that the point is in the lattice if and only if once you reduce it modulo p of b, you end up with a zero point. So this is, um, you'll see it again in the next, um, in the next talk, uh, but this is something I want to emphasize, it's kind of a idea, an idea that shows up a lot in, in uh, lattice-based constructions. Um, maybe I mentioned one more thing before we take a short break. Uh, any, any questions about that? So, as I said, it's a very, it's a very basic idea. One thing we have to keep in mind, this is, somewhat confusing, but you can see it here, that the shape actually does not matter. I mean, it's very misleading. You might think about the shape of this parallel pipe, but it actually it does not really matter. We're just using this parallel pipe as, as, a, as a tool to represent the position of a point relative to a lattice. We don't really care about the shape of this parallel pipe, at least for almost essentially all applications. This is not really the, the thing that matters. Um, but okay, you'll see maybe more of this later uh, today. Um, um, we can, you, know, we, you could represent the lattice with any parallel pipe, uh, and that would be equally, equally good. So you know, Fadim would even prove something like that later today. But let me just mention that there are many other fundamental regions. Not all fundamental regions have to be parallel pipe. Uh, there's much more fun you can do with fundamental regions. For instance, you can do this. You can take the lattice here, um, and you can put this nice uh, horse with a hawk on top of it. And turns out also a perfectly good fundamental region. You know, it's not as useful for crypto, but it's perfectly good. You, know, you can repeat that. Um, somehow it works, it's amazing. Um, you know, other fundamental regions are these you know, uh, ghost-like things there on the left, top left, and then the other thing there. And actually the one here, the hexagons are, this is not just for fun, the hexagons are actually very useful fundamental regions. They're known as the Voronoi cell. And there's been work recently on uh, algorithms for lattice problems using, using Voronoi cells. I don't think we'll see that here, but these are actually quite important. Um, Voronoi cells are simply the set of all points that are closest, say, to, to, um, to, uh, to say, the origin than any other lattice point. This gives you one cell of this, of this uh, Voronoi tessellation. Uh, we won't see it so much here, but this is, you know, this is quite useful. Okay, so I guess now we're supposed to take a break. Okay, and how long? Half an hour. Okay, enough to switch laptops. Good. Okay, thanks. So, uh, 
So just to summarize, um, so what we discussed so far were uh, bases of, of lattices. We saw when two bases are um, uh, equivalent. And uh, the next notion, the, the second notion we saw is that of uh, a fundamental region, which I should maybe say again. The fundamental region is the region that once you translate it by any lattice point, uh, you get a disjoint set of um, sets that, that, um, whose union is the whole plane, that cover the whole plane. Okay? So this is like this picture here, like pictures over there. Um, and it has an equivalent um, definition that um, you, know, you should never have um, two points of any translate of the lattice inside the body. That's, a, that, that's equivalent. Um, so such a body, such a fundamental region, contains exactly one representative of each coset. Um, so uh, the reason I motivated this, I motivated this by, by saying you want to store a function, but you'll see later in Vadim's talks, it's actually the motivation is usually slightly different. We want to take points and, for instance, see if the point is the largest point. Um, and we also, we don't really care about the point itself. We only care about its position relative to the lattice. And all we have to do is store um, the point modulo uh, a parallel pipe or you know, store its location in some fundamental region. Usually, it will be a fundamental parallel pipe because these are most convenient to work with. OK, so to bring me to the next notion, let's look at that picture again. And someone already during the break noticed it, so um, it's very nice. Let's look at this <coughs> square here So and consider the area of the square. So you look at the square, and you know, the area is 1, because it's 1 times 1. It's very easy. But what's the area of the parallelogram? Anyone remember? Uh, does anyone remember linear algebra? Yeah, so it's, yeah, so you compute and it is one. It's also one. And it's not a coincidence, actually. If you come to think of it, remember a fundamental region, the way I defined it, I said that if you repeat this region and put one on each lattice point, so you translate it by lattice points, you should get a <laughs> nice tessellation of the whole plane. And similarly there, and if you think about it for a few seconds, you convince yourself that this implies that this, these two areas must have the same volume, have the same area. And I mean, one way to prove it would be, you know, take kind of a very big area of the plane, and in assuming in that big area you have, like I say, a billion lattice points, uh, then you'd also expect to have a billion of these little regions inside. And so you have this billion regions that on one in one picture and another picture, and they both cover the same area, so they should have the same area because you know a billion of them kind of cover the same area of the plane. The reason I take so many is to kind of avoid the the, the shape, to ignore the to be able to ignore the shape of the, the specific shape of that region. And once I take many many of them, you know kind of average over a big area of space, they all have the same um, volume. But you can also, um, as someone uh, noticed here, you can also um, see directly for parallel pipe pits, as we'll see in a minute. But, but in general, this is true for any fundamental region. They all have the same area. So even though I have this uh, here, this strange horse with the hook, uh, I, can, I can know what the area is. I just compute the area, you know, say, of a fundamental parallel pipe pit or something that's easy to compute, and I know what the area of this shape is, just because it's, it's a fundamental region. Okay. And uh, another feature of these things, you'll see later in, um, in, in Vadim's talk, um, is that you can also kind of go from one to another, from one region to another. It's, it's, a, it's essentially bijection, a volume-preserving bijection from one to another. There's no difference if you, if you want to work modulo this parallel pipe or the other fundamental parallel pipe that kind of, you can easily go from one to another. They all essentially contain the same uh, information for us. Okay, this will be made precise, hopefully. Later, I'm happy to blame Vadim for everything uh, I don't do. So here's the next notion that I want to define. This is the determinant. So what's a determinant? Um, it's essentially that, that volume that I just mentioned. It tells us the density of lattice points. So what's determinant? A determinant is defined simply as the absolute value of the determinant of this basis matrix, of the matrix whose columns are the basis elements. Okay? So again, the determinant of a lattice L of B, if it's a lattice defined by a basis B, that generated by a basis B, it's simply the absolute value of the determinant of B. Um, and if you actually, you, you know, you stir the definition, the first thing you should ask yourself, is this well-defined? Is this a valid definition? Because 
I'm actually defining something, a property of a lattice based on a basis. And we know that a lattice has lots of bases. So for this to make sense, we really want to make sure that for different bases you get the same quantity. Indeed you do, and you have to, you know, you have to prove this, and, and the idea is this. I told you already that two different bases generate the same lattice, if and only if they are related by a multiplication by unimodular matrix. So if I have now different bases, B times U, then the determinant of that thing, of B times U, is um, you know, by, by simply by the multiplicativity of, of determinant, it's simply the determinant of B times the determinant of U, uh, again, absolute value, but a unimodular matrix, by definition, has a determinant either plus or minus one, so you, know, you can just cancel it and you get the determinant of B. So this is well-defined. Okay, determinant of a lattice is a well-defined notion, and it also has lots of geometrical meaning. It's, it tells us of the density of the points in the lattice. So if the determinant is big, it means the lattice is sparser. There's more space between the points. Okay? Um, so again, this, the reason this happens is because you should recall from linear algebra or whatever that the determinant of a, of a lattice is exactly the volume of the basic, of that parallel pipe generated by the columns of this matrix, of the matrix. Okay? So this is the formula for a volume of a parallel pipe is simply the absolute value of the determinant, in case you forgot. And, um, it, you know, you, as I told you before, the parallelepiped P of B is the fundamental region of, of a lattice. Um, so the volume of the parallelepiped is exactly the um, uh, is the determinant of B. Hence, it's exactly the determinant of the lattice. Hence, it's, it's the reciprocal. This determinant is the reciprocal of the density. So this is one property of a lattice that we can easily compute, right? This is something we can compute. The determinant is easy to compute. And, and you know, you have a lattice, you can easily tell what, you know, what density it has. Um, I'm, I'm, I keep mentioning computational things because this is the main, uh, the main point of, of, of lattices in crypto. Um, so this is one notion of determinant. Okay? So the next, the next notion I want to introduce is that of um, successive minima. And this is already... This is, um, far less trivial notion, um, and this, um, this is something that uh, mathematicians started working on early, this, and Minkowski has worked on this, and we'll show Minkowski's theorem on this. So what are successive minima? Um, so lambda 1, this is known as the first successive uh, minimum, lambda 1 is the length of the shortest vector in L. Okay, so you have a lattice L, and lambda 1 of L is simply the length of the shortest vector in that lattice. So actually the way it's defined here is, um, is wrong in two senses and missing another sense. Um, so I guess it's, the first thing it's missing is, the first thing it's wrong is because I asked for the shortest vector and actually the shortest vector is always zero. Zero is always a vector in the lattice. So, so of course I don't want to take that into account, so I, I say non-zero. The second thing I should specify is that um, length is, is, say, Euclidean length, L2 length. It doesn't have to be Euclidean, but usually it's going to be Euclidean. Um, there's also interesting stuff happening for non-Euclidean norms, but we don't need it here, so I think we'll be happy with L2 length, just the Euclidean norm of the vector, the usual norm. Uh, there's actually one more thing missing here. Uh, one thing that's not fully precise, can anyone guess? Exactly. It should be, instead of the shortest vector, it should be a shortest vector, because there's really never one. There's always at least two, because if you have a shortest vector, its negation is also a vector of the same length. It's also a vector in the lattice. Okay? But often you might, sometimes you might have more. You might have, like, take z to the n. z to the n, you have two n shortest vectors, okay? and two on each axis. Um, but it's, it's never there. It's always there, but you know, at least I, people often say the shortest vector and just you know, forget about it. But it's, to be precise, one should say a shortest vector. Uh, so this is lambda 1. This is the first successive minimum, and you can guess there are more. So more generally, the way we define the oldest successive minima is the following. So lambda k, so k is between 1 and n. I should say n is always, for me, the dimension of the lattice. I, uh, um, so for me, n is always the dimension of that. So k is between 1 and n. It's kind of the, the, it's the radius where you start seeing k dimensions. You start seeing k linearly independent vectors. 
So in the picture here, um, you see the shortest vector, um, and you notice that there is y is the shortest vector here, but it doesn't count. That's not that's not what's going to determine um, lambda two. For lambda two, I need to have a linearly independent vector. Hence, this is the first vector, the first radius where I start seeing two two vectors. Okay, two linearly independent vectors. Okay, so <coughs> again, this is this is the vector. This is lambda one. The length of this vector is lambda one. And lambda two is not this vector, but actually the one here, the point where you start seeing two linearly independent vectors. Okay. So uh, usually what we care about is lambda one, which is the shortest non-zero vector, and lambda n, which is kind of the other extreme, lambda n is the radius where you have n linearly independent vectors. You have a, you know, a essentially basis of the entire space, entire linear space. Not the basis of the lattice, but basis of the entire space. It's not always the same. So um, the next notion I need, uh, and I will use that quite a lot. This is a very useful notion. It's actually, this is basically in algebra. This, uh, you know, some of you might have seen uh, in, in basically in algebra course. This has nothing to do with, with lattices, but it's very useful also in relation with, with lattices. So, so what, is this, what is this process? It's, it's called the gram schmidt tokenization. I'm sure most of you have heard it. But let's try to recall exactly how it works. This is very useful for lattices. Um, so wh what we have, we have a sequence of vectors. We want to make them orthogonal. So the way we do it is we kind of um, project each vector on the orthogonal span of all the previous ones. Okay, so it's, it's, um, it's a sequence of vectors, okay, v1, v2, up to vn. And each time, project each vector on the orthogonal span of the other ones. It's, there's an uh, important ordering of the vectors. It's not just a set of vectors. Okay. <laughs> so let's stir it a bit. So I have V1 there, and then V2 is going to be projected on the orthogonal space of V1. So I take V2 and kind of shift it to be orthogonal to V1, and it's going to look like that. Okay. Notice that V2 tilde is no longer in the lattice. As I said, this process you know, is not a, a lattice process. It's you know, some other process from linear algebra. And it's not surprising, V2 tilde is not a lattice point. Okay, don't expect it to be. Um, still, this is very useful. Uh, if you want to write it in linear algebra, it's a good exercise to figure out exactly how to compute the V2 tilde. So V1 tilde um, is simply V1. Okay? The first vector, if I project it on the <coughs> orthogonal span of the previous one. There are no previous vectors, so it just stays in place. But V2 tilde is already more interesting. It's V2 minus the inner product of V2 with V1 tilde. Um, and then I go in the direction um, of, um, so, so, so it's V2 minus the projection of V2 on, on, on the span of V1, which is what's written there, right? So it's V2 inner product V1 tilde times uh, V1 tilde divided by the norm of V1 tilde squared. Anyway, it's, it's easy to figure out, even if you don't see it immediately. It's an exercise. Um, the, the exact, the exact uh, expression does not really matter for us. What matters is that uh, the, the, the procedure creates a set of orthogonal vectors. And um, it has lots of nice properties. So I mean, this is two vectors. You should imagine what happens if you have three vectors. So like the third vector is here. And you project it orthogonally to the board. Okay. One nice thing in connection with lattices is this, and this is something Vadim will use maybe somewhat implicitly in his, in his notes, in his, in his talk. The, this is what I would call the gram schmidt fundamental region. Okay, so I already showed you lots of fundamental region, horses and stuff, but this is another one. It's sometimes useful, um, sometimes shows up in proofs. Uh, so let's take a basis, let's take a lattice and a basis, like the basis over there, I have these two vectors, and they, you know, they define the fundamental parallel pipette the one over there, and we know it's a fundamental region. If I would repeat it, I would get, you know, I would get this nice, uh, okay, it goes, you know, continues in all directions. I just had, at some point I had to stop, but this is really a nice covering of the whole plane. Um, but you could also now take the gram schmidt uh, orthogonalization of that basis, and you end up with two vectors, you know, V1 and V2 tilde, so V1 tilde and V2 tilde. Uh, V2 tilde is not, not, no longer um, a lattice point. But if you consider the box the two generate, you consider this box, it's also a parallel pipette, but it's generated by orthogonal vectors, so it's, I would call it a box. You notice this is also a fundamental region. 
Okay, so this, is, this is what it creates. It's kind of a brick wall region. And it's not a coincidence. This, this always works, and it's not difficult to prove um, that also the gram schmidt generates a fundamental region. Okay, and this, is, this is sometimes useful, and it's, um, it should show up also in the next talk. Um, okay, so maybe I'll say, in the next slide, I'll say a bit why this happens. I'll try to show them mathematically why this happens. It's easier to see than geometrically. Okay. So, um, okay, so now that we have a way to generate from any basis an orthogonal set, the next logical thing to do would be to normalize the vectors and have an autonormal set, right? Um, and this is what uh, um, allows us to take any basis, any lattice basis, V1 up to Vn, so apply gram schmidt orthogonalization, and now normalize the vectors. And this brings you to the vectors V1 tilde divided by normal V1 tilde and so on, up to Vn tilde divided by normal Vn tilde. Now this is orthonormal vectors. Again, they're not lattice points. There's no need for them to be. But what's very nice about this basis, and this is it's often very useful to think in terms of this basis, is that, so notice this is a basis in the linear algebra sense, not in terms of lattice sense. Okay, it's, it's a basis, I think of it as a basis of R to the N. And what's nice about this basis is if you now try to write your, ba your, your lattice basis, okay, V1, V2 up to Vn, try to express it in this basis. Now the columns are going to be now the lattice vectors, but written in this basis of R to the N. Okay, so not in the standard basis anymore, I just kind of, I, I rotate everything, I rotate and I use, it, I use a different basis of R to the N, and you end up with something very nice. You end up with this upper triangular form. It's extremely useful, and you, you see, we now prove two things using it. It's a, it's a very nice way to, to think of, of a lattice basis. Okay, so I should say all I've done, I, I took the matrix V1, V2 up to Vn, the, the original matrix, and I just changed, um, you know, changed my, uh, my basis. I essentially multiplied from the left by an orthogonal matrix. So essentially I didn't do anything. I just viewed the same vectors in a different basis of R to Dn, different autonormal basis. Um, so everything stays the same, all the Euclidean norms stay the same, just a rotation of space. And I notice what happened, for instance, the vector V1, you know, is very simple. The vector V1 in this, currently in this basis, just looks like, you know, uh, non -zero, some, some non-zero number in the first coordinate and then zeros everywhere else. This is just because the vector V1 is, by definition, you know, the same as V1 tilde. It's in the direction of V1 tilde. So we already know that V1 uh, is only in the first axis. Now the second vector, V2, again by definition it's in the span of the first, maybe I should go back to show you this, here. So, so V2 is in the span of V1 tilde and V2 tilde, right? In this plane, I guess in two dimensions everything is going to be in the span of these two vectors, but you can imagine maybe in, in, in higher dimension how this would work. So again, the second vector is uh, some non-zero element in the first coordinate, and then in the second coordinate it has, uh, you can see it has V2 to tilde. The norm of V to tilde is what it has in the second coordinate. Okay, um, okay. so this is, this is a sim simply a different way to write the same basis, but this is a very convenient, um, so one way, um, one thing perhaps to try to use, prove using that is to try to prove that the Gram-Schmidt uh, box is, um, is a fundamental uh, is a fundamental uh, region. I, I won't show this actually, it's not difficult. Uh, I'll show two other lemmas that you can prove using that. I should also, so, I should also mention this is uh, sometimes known as uh, QR decomposition, if you've seen that in linear algebra, this kind of uh, decomposition of a matrix into orthogonal, this is the Q part, and R, this upper triangular part. Okay. But it, it gets a special meaning once you uh, apply to lattice spaces. Okay, so two, two things I want to prove. The first one is, is quite easy. Um, it says that the determinant of a lattice generated by uh, V1 up to Vn is simply the product of the norms of, of uh, Vi tilde. Okay. And you can essentially see it here. It's the upper triangular matrix. So the norm, uh, the, the deter determinant of an upper triangular matrix is simply the product of the things on the diagonal. So you just get the product of all the Vi tildes, the norms of the Vi tildes. So this is, this is very easy. Um, this is sometimes a, a useful fact. Um, and maybe a more useful fact is the second one. This is much more useful. Um, um, and this is that 
lambda 1, which is the, recall, this is the first successive minimum. This is the length of the shortest non-zero vector. This has to be at least the minimum of the VI tildes, the norm of the VI tildes. So let's try to uh, stir this matrix and prove it. Um, so recall, what is, the, what is the lattice? The lattice is simply all integer combinations of the columns of this matrix. Okay. So this matrix, the columns generate the lattice. Okay. All we did was simply rotating a bit our basis, but this doesn't change anything. So this is, imagine this is our lattice. It generated by the columns of this matrix, by all integer combination of the columns of the matrix. So the first thing to notice is an upper triangular matrix. So the first thing to notice, if you use a non-zero coefficient on the rightmost column, if you use a non-zero coefficient in the rightmost column, then surely the length of the lattice vector you're going to get is at least the norm of V and tilde. Okay, and you see that that's because of the last coordinate. Okay, so if I, uh, if I take here a non-zero coefficient here, then the the absolute value here of the last coordinate is at least the norm of V and tilde. So the norm of the vector is also going to be at least norm of V and tilde, even if all the previous ones somehow cancel and become zero. So this is easy, right? So if the last coordinate is non-zero, um, last, so last coefficient we take is non-zero, it's easy. We know that it's at least V and tilde, which is you know, at least as big as the minimum between the V and tilde. So what happens if, it's, if it, it is zero, if the last coefficient is zero? Then consider the next to last. If the next to last is non zero, okay, and now the last one is zero. So if the next to last is non zero, then the next to last coordinate here is going to be the norm of v n minus 1 tilde, at least in absolute value, which is also good. Right? And so on. So essentially, what you're doing, you're saying take any non zero combination of the columns, integer combination of the columns. Take the last column that has a non zero coefficient. And that column is going to give you here an entry that's bigger than the meaning of the norm of the VI tilde, and then you're done. <coughs> okay. So it's always that the last and zero gives you entry that cannot be cancelled anywhere because it's upper triangular, and whenever it appears, nothing else can cancel it. Okay. So this is a very basic statement. This is this is nice because this this is one way. Uh, one very useful way to get lower bounds on, on lambda 1, which is otherwise a difficult number to get a handle on, to lower bound lambda 1. This is the way you, you would do it. Okay? It's useful, useful in, the, in connection with the LLA algorithm. Okay, so this is, this is it. And I think now we can try to prove something more interesting. This is uh, Minkowski's theorem. Um, we start with another theorem, a more basic one, uh, by Blichfeld, and it says the following thing. Um, so now, consider any lattice. Uh, now I use lambda and not L, uh, but it's the same, it's the same uh, idea. Um, just different notation. So take any lattice lambda, and now let S be any set um, that whose volume is bigger than the determinant of the lattice. Okay. And then what, what the theorem says is then inside the set, you must find two points whose difference is itself, the difference vector is itself it has this point. Okay. Um, notice that it's necessary to require the volume to be bigger than the determinant because recall that if you take any fundamental region, um, then in a fundamental region you'll never have two points whose difference is at this point. I told you that from any cost that you only have one representative, but this will never happen when you take a fundamental region. So it's necessary to require volume bigger than the determinant. Um, and let's see how you prove it. So. Uh, the idea is actually, it's very um, geometrical. Um, you, take a, you take a kangaroo and the, the you think, <laughs> think of it as really um, fat, uh, very fat kangaroo. Uh, and the, the volume of the kangaroo is bigger than the determinant of the lattice. So this picture is misleading because it's in two dimensions. Uh, and because uh, I want to, you know, uh, not to make it too ridiculous, uh, but think of this kangaroo as being fat and being bigger than the determinant of the lattice. Actually, I think it's, if you look at it, it seems like much smaller, but think of this being bigger. Um, so I have a kangaroo, and now what I do, this is my set S, okay, so the S is the, is the kangaroo is the set S. And now what I want to do is just want to repeat this set kind of all over the place. I take translations of the set by lattice points. Okay, so I take another one here, and, you know, bring all the other in. Great. 
those whole zoo of kangaroos. Um, and they all should be exactly positioned in the same place. Okay, I just shifted them by lattice points. And the key observation now to make this work is that because the kangaroo is fat, because it's bigger than the determinant of the lattice, it must, it has no room. It has to overlap with itself. Because remember, the determinant of a lattice is exactly the kind of the, the volume that dedicated to each lattice point. And if you're fatter than that, there's no room. And you can prove that. I'm not going to prove it, but you can easily prove that rigorously, that there must be intersection between the kangaroos. Okay, they cannot be disjoined just by volume arguments. Okay, there's just not enough room. If you take a, say, large area of space, you'll see there are too many kangaroos, there's too much volume, and there's nowhere for them to fit. Okay, so now you take this, uh, this picture, and now you know there's a place where they intersect. So, for instance, you see, you see in the section here, you see that this area you know, between the ears of the kangaroo, I'm not so good with kangaroo anatomy, anatomy, but this area here in the ears is the same as the, you know, what's it, like the ankle of the, of the kangaroo. Okay, so they intersect. The, the, the area between the ears, because the brain intersects with the ankle of the, of the can kangaroo. And what I'm going to do now is look at the intersection point and take one kangaroo and take these two points on, on one kangaroo. I take this. I take the, the area between the ears of one kangaroo and also the, the ankle of the same kangaroo, and I, I draw a line. And all that remains to notice is that these are two points inside the same kangaroo, inside the same S, and the difference between these two points, meaning this, this vector, is a, is, is a vector of the lattice. It's a lattice vector. And this is because, as I told you, the translation of the kangaroos is, is, is by lattice vectors. Okay? So the difference between the top kangaroo and the middle one is a lattice vector. Hence, this vector, and you can see it here, it's not really a proof, but this vector is really a lattice vector. Okay, so what we, we showed is that it's a very basic statement. Whenever you have something of volume bigger than determinant, it must inside, it's a, inside contain two points whose difference is the lattice point. Okay? And this is already, um, you know, uh, we already did 90% of the work towards proving Minkowski's theorem, which is the next thing I'd like to mention. This is Minkowski's theorem. And it says that if you take any lattice, again, lambda, and you take any set S, but now we have some requirements on S. It cannot be kangaroo anymore. It should be uh, a convex set, something like that, a convex set. And it should be also um, symmetric around the origin. So it means that um, if X is an S, and also minus X is an S. Okay, it's a symmetry around the origin. So S is the same as minus S. Um, so something like the body over there. Um, then what the theorem says is that if the volume of S is now bigger, not just bigger than the determinant, but actually bigger than 2 to the n times the determinant, then there's actually, uh, I should say, a non-zero, non-zero lattice point in S. Okay, I should have said non-zero, otherwise it's obvious. Zero is always in S, okay, because we assume zero, S is symmetric around zero. Okay, so there exists a non-zero lattice point in S. Okay, so this is Minkowski theorem, and this is it's a very powerful statement. It allows us, it tells us there must be lattice point inside certain bodies. Okay? Um, and it has a, see, a simple proof. It follows from Blickfeld, but still it's, it's, it's quite a remarkable statement. Um, so here's the way to prove it. Uh, maybe I should, before proving it, before proving it, let's just say why, uh, why I need the set to be, say, convex. If the set is not convex, maybe you can imagine, you can imagine a set that kind of goes in between the lattice points and never touches lattice points. The set can be huge, can have a huge volume, but never touches any lattice point. Okay? Uh, because it's not convex, it can do strange things like... You know. And I also need to be zero symmetric. You can imagine a, a convex but not zero symmetric set, like a very tall rectangle that never touches Z squared, never touches the integers, but still has a huge volume. Okay, so both requirements are necessary. It's not just, not just because I'm, I'm lazy, or Minkowski was lazy. Um, and here's the proof. So the first idea is to take S and shrink it by a factor 2. So I take S and I, I kind of shrink it by a factor 2 in each dimension. So I get a set which I call S over 2. Okay, just take all, you know, all X over 2 for X in S. Um, one thing to notice, which is maybe... Um, is that the volume of S over 2 is not half the volume of S. Okay, we're, in, we're in n dimensions, 
So what, if you shrink something by, by two, the volume shrinks by two to the n, right? Like you know from you know, <laughs> formulas for area of, of the circle or of volume of spheres. Um, so S over two therefore has volume bigger than the determinant of lambda. And by the previous theorem, by Bigfield theorem, we know that there are two points, you see, Z1 and Z2, inside S over two, okay, inside this half S, and whose difference, this vector between them, Z1 minus Z2, is the largest point. <coughs> so why are we not done? Because we want, we want actual vector, lattice vector inside S. Okay, currently, we just have two vectors in S over two whose difference is, is inside S. But now we're almost, almost done. We just have to do one more step or two more steps. You know, because Z1 is an S over two, by definition, twice of Z1 is an S. Just by definition. Okay, so I multiply the Z1 by 2, I get 2 Z1 and I'm in S. And similarly, I take Z2 and I multiply by 2 and also negate it. I can also negate because I know that my set is zero symmetric. So minus twice of Z2 is, in, is also in S. Okay, so now I have both 2 Z1 and minus 2 Z2 are both in S. And why is that so nice? Because now the average, take the average of these two points, which must be in S because S is convex. So take the average between these two points, and what's the average of these two points is exactly Z1 minus Z2. Okay? The average of 2Z1 and minus 2Z2, the average of these two things is Z1 minus Z2. And we know that this is uh, at this point, right? Because of the first item. The first item of the proof said that Z1 minus Z2 is at this point. Okay. So this is, this is it. So this is the proof of uh, Minkowski's theorem. And what it essentially allows us to do, it allows us to say that lattices, lattices have short vectors. It allows us to say that lattices must have vectors of a certain length, and this is what we can use as a corollary, we can drive as a corollary now. Um, and here's the corollary. So it says that for any, take any lattice lambda, it tells you that the, the shortest vector of lambda must be a short vector of length at most square root n times the determinant of lambda to the 1 over n, to the power 1 over n. Um, so if you see this for the first time, maybe I should say that the determinant of lambda to the 1 over n is actually very natural, and you can actually forget it. It kind of has to be there. This is simply a scaling factor. Right? So imagine I take a, a lattice lambda and I just scale it by a factor 10. Just scale everything by a factor 10. So you know, the left-hand side, obviously just also scales by a factor 10. So for this inequality to make sense, uh, to scale it properly, I also want the right-hand side to scale by a factor 10. And this is what the determinant to the power 1 over n does. Right? Because when I scale a lattice by a factor 10, the determinant goes up by a factor of 10 to the n. Right? It's a determinant of n by n matrix. Um, and I take it to the power 1 over n, hence both left and right-hand side, both of them scale by a factor 10. And this is what you would expect. Right? You don't expect anything to happen when you scale a lattice. So kind of this determinant to the 1 over n is very natural. It should be there. It's a very, uh, just a scaling factor. And the interesting thing is the square root n. So it tells you that an equivalent way to state this, this corollary is that uh, any lattice of determinant 1 must have uh, a vector of length at most square root n. Uh, actually, you can improve the constant a bit. I didn't really worry about the constant. You can have a slightly smaller factor. Uh, you can have c times square root n for c is more than 1, but we usually don't care about that too much, uh, even though it's an interesting question. OK, so how do you prove that? So the proof is a special case of the previous theorem. We just take, take a ball of radius square root n. Uh, and all you have to notice is that its, its volume is greater than 2 to the n. So if I take any lattice of determinant 1, then the ball uh, of radius square root n has volume greater than 2 to the n, hence must contain a point. And any point inside the ball of radius square root n is by definition of norm at most uh, square root n. Okay. And the reason the ball of radius square root n contains, uh, it has volume at least 2 to the n is because it contains this box minus 1, 1, the interval minus 1, 1 to the n. Okay, why? Because you know, the norm of any point inside that box is at most square root n. Okay? The largest norm is the all one point, which has norm square root n. 
It seems very wasteful, but actually it's not a wasteful argument. The volume of the, of the ball is not much bigger than 2 to the n. So I lost a bit, but it's essentially square root n up to a constant before the square root n. Um, so what we managed to do here, finding short vectors in, in lattice is something that so far we can only do uh, mathematically. We don't know how to do it algorithmically, explicitly. This is, this is essentially what crypto is based on. The lattice-based crypto is based on the assumption this thing is so hard. We don't know how to find just such vectors efficiently. If you, if you notice, you look more carefully at this argument, there's some kind of magic, some non-explicit argument that went in here, some kind of um, pigeonhole principle, some kind of collision argument that went in, in the Blickfeld theorem. <clears throat> we just said there are too many things that cannot all fit into one box, but, but this, this theorem doesn't give you any way to, to actually find the shortest vector. It tells you shortest vector the short vector exists, but we have no idea how to find it efficiently. Okay, and this, this difficulty to find these things efficiently is what we are um, building the, the cryptography on. Okay, so questions on this part? Good. Okay. Um, okay. So this now brings me to the, uh, the last topic um, of uh, today: is this the issue of computational problems? Uh, this is actually this is. Uh, this is a huge area. I don't think I can uh, cover any of it. Um, I just want to just give you a glimpse on, uh, on what's uh, happening in that area. Um, usually, I mean, we'll, in the next few days, we'll just um, you take these problems and assume they're hard and do crypto based on them. We won't worry about the problems too much. Uh, we'll see a tiny bit of it in, in Vadim's talk, maybe in, on my, in my talk on Wednesday. But um, I think most of the talks won't uh, have to deal with these problems too specifically. So let's. So let's see what, it, what the main problems are. Uh, first, maybe let's start with kind of easy problems. Um, for instance, this is an easy problem, easy, easy lattice problem. If I give you a basis and the vector v, can you check if v is in, is in the lattice LB? How do you do that? How do you solve that? All right, now you can do Gaussian elimination. Good. So now, uh, now you can do Gaussian elimination. Take the vector, the vector I give you, take v and just express it as a linear combination of your basis vectors, v1 up to vn. There's a unique way to express it, and you can find it using Gaussian elimination. Right? v1 up to vn are linearly independent, just basic linear algebra. And now all you have to do is just check if the coefficients are integer. If the coefficients are integer, it's a lattice point. If not, it's not a lattice point. Okay? So this is very easy to do, and we actually need that in, in some of the talks, so this is a useful fact to keep in mind. And kind of the, the reason this is easy is because it's not geometrical. It's really a question of like linear algebra, not a geometric equation. This is why it's easy. A similar question also, of algebraic, linear algebraic question is, you know, if I give you two bases, B1 and B2, can you tell if they're the same, generate the same lattice? So there are several ways to solve it. Um, you know, one of them was using what we saw before. I told you that they're going to be, they're equivalent, B1 and B2 are equivalent, if and only if, B1 is B2 times U for some unimodular U. So you can try to compute U. So you take B1 times B2 inverse. You get a matrix. You check if it's unimodular. Um, maybe this is a bit uh, unnecessarily complicated. You can maybe do it more basic uh, first principles. One way to do it, another way to do it would be take any element of the basis here. There are n vectors. And for each one, check that it's in the other lattice. Okay, so take the n basis elements and for each one check that it's in the other lattice. If they are, you know that L of B1 is contained in L of B2. Because if each of the basis elements is in L of B2, also all the integer combinations. A lattice is always closed under addition. And now just do the same thing in reverse. Take each of the basis elements of B2 and check that it's in L of B1. And if this is also the case, then you know they're equal because one containing the other and the other containing the first, then you know they're equal. Okay, there are lots of ways to solve it. Both the things are anyway, they're easy. The difficulty comes in once we start, you know, once we try to do something more geometrical, argue about long vectors, short vectors, then it becomes harder, much harder, it seems. And this is kind of the prototypical problem is known as the shortest vector problem. And what it asks is, you know, I, I give you a lattice. So what does it mean I give you a lattice? This is actually important to understand. A lattice is always specified by a basis. Okay? 
I specify an arbitrary basis, not a nice one. It can be like very long vectors. Um, and then I ask you, can you find a short vector in this lattice? Can you find a combination of these vectors, V1 up to Vn, that somehow cancel magically and become a short vector? And this is essentially the shortest vector problem. Uh, the, actually, the variant that we'll need here that's used for crypto is the, the approximation variant. So this is the parameter gamma, and gamma is the approximation factor. So what I ask you to do, I ask you to find a vector that's not necessarily the shortest, but only within the factor gamma of the shortest. Okay, so there's the goal in SVP gamma is to find a vector whose length is at most gamma times the shortest, gamma times lambda one. Okay. Um, I mentioned in the next slide what's, uh, in a few slides, what's known about these problems. This is, this is one problem. Um, this is kind of the prototypical. I mentioned a few others. First, I should mention that there's another variant of this question, which, uh, oh, and here's the lattice in the shortest vector, but you already knew that. And here's another variant of this question. This is um, more like a decision version, a gap version, um, where I don't, I, I don't ask you to find the vector. I just ask you to tell me um, the length of the vector. I actually ask you to approximate the length of the vector. So for instance, I can ask you, tell me if the length of the vector is less than one or more than gamma. The details actually don't really matter, but this, this problem, this decision version, turns out to be more uh, uh, useful for crypto, usually. Um, most crypto constructions are based on, on this, or, or the next problem I'll show, on the SIVP. But in any case, both problems, SVP and GAP, SVP, they have this approximation factor, gamma, this is a very important parameter, because as you change gamma, the problem becomes you know, either hard or easy. When gamma is, is very big, the problem is easy because I don't ask you to do so much, but when gamma is small, the problem seems to become very hard. So we'll see exactly what's known about this in a few slides. So I'll mention a few other problems. This, this problem is quite important in, in, in crypto because somehow most constructions are, uh, many constructions are based on it. It's known as the shortest independent vectors problem. And this is simply the, the, the lambda and analog of the, of the previous one. So previously I asked you to find the shortest vector or something that's within gamma of the shortest vector. And now what I ask you is to find n linearly independent vectors in, in, the, in the lattice. Okay? And, and the goal is that for these linearly independent vectors to be not much longer than the shortest possible. So the shortest possible is, is lambda n. That's by definition. Right? The definition of lambda n is the, you know, the, the shortest radius where you can have uh, the shortest norm where you can have n linearly independent vectors. And I ask you to find something that's at most gamma bigger, at most factor gamma bigger. So now, uh, again, we have this basis, V1, V2. It generates certain lattice. And kind of, we don't know what lattice generates. Computationally, it's hard to figure this out. And I ask you to find, in this case, two vectors that are kind of short. Okay. So this actually, I think, is really the shortest. Uh, this is really lambda 2, but in general, it can be some approximation factor away from lambda 2. Okay, this is SIVP. I mentioned a few others. Um, we need that on Tuesday. I'll, I'll recall the definition, so don't, you don't have to remember that. Um, but it's quite natural. So the closest vector problem, the closest vector problem asks, now we have a lattice, we have a point V, and I ask you, find a nearby lattice point. How nearby? It doesn't have to be the closest. It can be within a factor of gamma of the closest. So this is, this is known as the closest vector problem. Um, OK, so. Again, I have a point, and I'm trying to find a nearby lattice point. Um, doesn't have to be the closest, but only within the gamma factor of the closest. This is CVP, the closest vector problem. Uh, and one actually cute result, this is a nice exercise, um, is, is this. It's due to Goldreich, Michancho, uh, Safra, and Cypher it's from 99. It's a nice exercise. Um, they show, I mean, there are lots, nowadays there are many results like that, but this is, this is a especially nice one, um, you know, one of the classical results in this area um, showing that you know, for any gamma, for any approximation factor gamma, SVP is not harder than CVP. <coughs> or in other words, if, you, you know, if you're able to solve CVP, if you have a way to solve, you know, approximate the closed vector problem to within a factor of 10, you can also solve the shortest vector problem to within a factor of 10. Uh, if you think about it intuitively, it seems maybe, first it seems obvious. Right? What's the obvious thing to try? Zero. Right? So I want to find a short vector. So what I'll do, I'll simply ask 
give me the closest point to zero, hoping to find the short vector. But the problem with that is that, yeah, just get zero, because zero is the closest point to zero. And that's not really useful, okay? because what we're actually after is the shortest non-zero vector. Um, so that's a clever trick that they used. Um, and you, know, you can try to think about it. Um, but you can show that somehow you can modify this reduction size of the point you ask somehow is not in the lattice. So you take, you take a sub lattice and then ask for a point that's missing from the lattice. But it's, it requires some thought. It's, it's a, it's a nice, nice proof. Okay, so you can try to think about it. It's not really important for the rest, just to give you some flavor. And there are lots of connections between all these problems. So these problems are strongly uh, interrelated, even though not everything is understood. One last problem in the, uh, is, is what's known as the bounded distance decoding, or BDD. So it's bounded distance decoding. It's like, like CVP, like closed vector problem, but now I, I tell you the point V is already pretty close to the lattice. I mean, you have to make it precise, but you have a point V that's already pretty close to the lattice, and you just have to find the closest point. This point, this problem, this problem plays an important role in, in lattice-based crypto. Okay, this is BDD problem, bounded distance decoding. Okay, so... What's known about this, all these problems? There are lots of things known. I won't be able to show you proofs, of course. I just want you to know this is actually important for you to get the right history, the right background on you know, why, we, why we think these problems are good for crypto, right? You, know, you might think you know, maybe there's, there's no, reason, no reason to think they're hard, but actually there's been lots of work on these problems. Um, what do we know in terms of algorithms? So there are lots of attempts to find algorithms to solve to solve lattice problems. Um, the first one we mentioned is the LLL algorithm from 1982. Um, now I can finally tell you what the algorithm does. The algorithm is a polynomial time algorithm, so it's an efficient algorithm. Actually, you can run it, there are lots of software packages for running it. It, um, it runs very well, even in high dimensions, like several hundreds, it's, you can easily do it. Um, and what the algorithm produces, is produces a um, short vector. Uh, the only problem is that it produces uh, a very mildly short vector. Uh, more precisely, the, the approximation factor you get is essentially 2 to the n. You get a, a vector that's essentially longer by a factor of 2 to the n than the shortest vector. Okay, so it's exponentially longer than the shortest vector. It's still highly non-trivial, right? Uh, especially if you think of n as being small, if you try to do it in, in, in small dimensions, which is often needed in practice for many applications, for many uh, cryptographic attacks, all you need is small n's a few tens, and you can still do magic with that. But in high dimensions, which is what we use in crypto, say like 500, this starts to be uh, very important, and, and the algorithm produces very bad results, produces very long vectors. So two to the n, um, the, the exponential is a very bad approximation. Um, so this is um, work of, uh, as I said, Lenz and Salovas, with improvement by Schnorr, Aitai Kumar, Shiva Kumar. Um, there's another line of work, more recent, uh, very interesting one, um, trying to attack it from a different angle, trying to find exact algorithms, trying to really solve shortest vector problem, but doing it as efficiently as possible. This is an interesting line of work. It's not no longer in, in polynomial time, of course. The best we know how to do is in time that's essentially two to the order n, exponential time. And there's lots of nice work in this area. I started with uh, one of the main results is Aitai Kumar Shiva Kumar, 2002. And even uh, more recently, a paper by Michan from the Vulgars and more recent work of Impala and Dadush. And there are lots of nice, lots of nice results that, that show interesting ideas how to solve lattice problems. So lots of interesting ideas using Voronoi cells, the thing I mentioned before, um, using ellipsoid coverings, lots of nice ideas, but um, somehow, none of them is able to go below time 2 to the n. It seems very, very difficult to go below time 2 to the, to the n, which gives us uh, cryptographers hope that these problems are, are really hard. Um, it's actually, maybe it's nice, I should have d d said it before, this is nice to contrast with things like factoring, where if you, if you see factoring had um, uh, important algorithmic improvements. Factoring started with slow exponential time algorithms and then came you know, quadratic field sieve and number field sieve and these algorithms are amazingly efficient, right? Sub-exponential time algorithms and they do things that were considered impossible before their um, uh, invention. Um, and contra contrary to that, if you, if you consider the last 30 years in lattices, 
Um, there have been lots of ideas, lots of beautiful algorithms, but if you actually consider the improvements we get, there isn't, isn't much happening. Uh, you know, we, still, we still need time to do the end to solve these problems. Okay? And this is maybe an encouraging sign okay, that these problems may be really hard, um, whereas factoring seems like there may be more to do there. But uh, at least the number of fields is a Amazing algorithms, but I don't see any reason why that would be the last word. Okay, it's, it's, it seems a bit strange for that to be the last word. Something in between those two algorithms? Yes, yes. I, I didn't say, but there's a way to interpolate. Exactly. You can interpolate between the two, and I think you could do something like, uh, say, approximation 2 to the square root n in time 2 to the square root n. Yeah, this is, I think, Kanan did this in the 80s. Um, Another nice thing about this, this, again, contrary to things like factoring, there's really no, no quantum algorithm advantage. If you look you know, what's known in terms of quantum algorithms, there's really um, not much and definitely nothing that improves these algorithms. Okay, so it seems like the problem is, is, is really hard. Okay. Is it, it's really surprising that you, can, uh, that you cannot get better than the exact algorithms because the exact version of the problem is NPR. So, so I meant, right. One should be careful about the reduction, but um, what I meant actually to say, I should say, that's true, but for crypto, what I should have said is that, thanks, I should have said the polynomial, even a pro polynomial approximation is 2 to the n. It hasn't been improvement there, too. This is actually the, the kind of approximation factors we care about here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but for, even for exact, I don't think 2 to the n, so, okay, we can think about it later. I'm not sure. I have to. Uh, answers from the. Yeah, but is, it, is there a linear, near linear? I don't think. You usually use a polynomial. Okay, if, if Chris thinks so, I'm happy to say that. that. Yeah, I think you use some polynomial in the reduction usually. Yeah. How much better are heuristics? No, I would be very happy with heuristic. Yeah. Give me any heuristic. Yeah. I don't need uh, anything, I don't need any proof. Just give me. Okay, just improve on the constants, but not anything that's not Not even constants, I don't think. Okay, that's true. There are some modifications of LL, uh, modifications of uh, BKZ algorithms that are mostly heuristic. But I think they are in the same ballpark. I wouldn't say there's a like if, uh, heuristics are what we need, right? But I don't think there's any heuristic that really seems to outperform this. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's pretty much the same. Uh, okay, so this is kind of one regime. The regime, now we discuss the far right hand side when the approximation is exponential. When we're dealing with the approximations that are bigger than 2 to the n. The other end is the NP hardness regime. Here we have NP hardness results, but this is only for very small approximation factors. This doesn't really matter for crypto that much, but I just want to let you know that if gamma is very small, like say smaller than n to the c over log log n, then we have NP hardness results, and this was done for gap SVP. Actually, already uh, Van de Boas in the early 80s did that, and more recently, strong results, the Nur, Kindler, um, Raz, and Safra. And also for SVP, there's been, uh, uh, been some work. Both results show very strong hardness results, but still they're kind of in this very low regime. It's less than any polynomial. This is a very, you know, compared to the other, a very small number. Um, so the problems are NP-hard, but that's not in the, not in the, dom not in the uh, regime that we care about for crypto. And the, the regime that we care about for crypto, and this would be Vadim's next talk, is the regime that starts from approximation factors roughly, I would say, n, n and above. Okay, when the approximation factor gamma is essentially the dimension or above, so it's like n or sometimes n to the 1.5. And, and, and there, you know, thanks to the work of Aita and others, um, we have one-way functions based on, on lattice problems, and we have public key crypto systems. This will be the rest of the winter school, so you'll get to see that. Um, but I should say all these all this results are in the, in the area of so n, n squared, so polynomial approximation factors. The approximation factor is n. It's not in the NP hardness regime. And there's yet another result, which is very nice, is something one can call limits on, on inapproximability. It's the results that show that the problem is, is unlikely to be NP-hard. It shows that as you go above square root n, as you go you know, to the right of, of square root n, the problem is in NP intersect coin P. And because it's in that class, it's unlikely to be, highly unlikely to be NP-hard. So what this, what this tells us is that we, you know, we're doing crypto based on a hard problem, but you know, we should not expect to do crypto based on the NP-hard problem. Okay, there's, there's a limit to how much one can hope. Um, and I mean, there are also reasons why we, we believe it's hard. It's, it should be difficult, if not impossible, to do crypto based on NP-hard problems, but this is beyond the topic of this, of this talk. But at least specifically here, you can really show that these problems are 
um, uh, not NPR, you know, assuming reasonable complexity theoretic assumptions. Because you can show that this is in NP to say quantity. Okay, so let's just summarize what you need to know for the rest of the day and the next few days is that what we care about is the problem of approximating um, shortest vector problem SVP or, or SIVP to within polynomial factors like n or n to the three halves or n squared. And, and these problems are believed to be hard. The best known algorithms are, require exponential time, two, time to two to the n. Um, this is a sign of work I mentioned before. So not just for exact algorithms, but also for approximation factors of n or n squared. Nothing better is known. Um, and there's no better quantum algorithm. So uh, it's hard. It seems to be equally hard also for quantum algorithms. Um, and on the other hand, it's not believed to be NP-hard. But still, this, this doesn't um, necessarily mean bad news. Okay? So the problem is believed to be very hard. Um, and this is what we'll do crypto uh, based on. So I think I should uh, let Vadim take the stage and see you again on tomorrow, I guess. Thanks.